beautiful opportunity to be in the house of the Lord together with the family of God. So thankful for all of you who are joining us tonight online, but also in spirit. I think as we lift up the name of the Lord tonight in worship and in praise, that he will draw us together in his presence. Because he promised where two or three are gathered in my name, there will I be in their midst. We're going to worship tonight around the theme of the grace of God. How wonderful his unmerited favor is toward us tonight. Amen. Let's sing this together. This old hymn chorus. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse. you know you're feeling it go ahead and do it I don't care where you are right now just go ahead if you if you can just let it out praise God 
Amen. Aren't you glad that his amazing grace is still good today in 2022? Wow, I already feel like preaching, teaching tonight. Amen. Well, we welcome you to our Wednesday night service. Thank you so much for tuning in. We want to give you an opportunity to give. And um, we have a number of different ways. You can give through our online, uh, through checks or your debit card, your credit card. You can give through our church app. You can mail in your tithe and offerings. Or uh, if you're here in person, you can put it in the offering boxes. And if all of that fails, you can come by and drop it off at the church. I'd like to pray a special prayer over our offering at this time. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would take every gift. And Lord, I, I know we can't buy your blessings, but I'm just asking for every person that gives. Lord, would you just give them a special blessing? And Lord, maybe there's someone right now that is saying, well, I really would like to give. I just do not have any thing I can give. Lord, would you open up the windows of heaven and bless them and provide so that they can give in the future. And let us worship as we give in Jesus' lovely and precious holy name. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, uh, Brother Philip has another beautiful song, and I want you to listen closely to the lyrics of this song. When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams and your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes and you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fear don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear praise the Lord he can work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord. Our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord. For the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you they drop powerless behind you when you praise him. Satan is a liar and he wants to make us think that we are paupers when he knows himself we're children of the king so lift up the mighty shield of faith the battle must be won we know that Jesus Christ is a risen soul the works already done praise the Lord work through those who praise him praise the lord our god inhabits praise praise the lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you they drop powerless behind you when you praise him praise him him when you praise him when you praise him when you praise the We welcome you again, and thank you for the music tonight. Thank you, Brother Philip. We uh, praise God for you tuning in. I hope that uh, your week has been good. I hope that you're expecting great things from the Lord. And uh, I, I would like to encourage you to uh, get a piece of paper and a pen or pencil and uh, follow along. Uh, this particular uh, study that I've been doing has really been a powerful uh, time for me. I hope that it has been for you. But we are now at Philippians chapter 3. 
Last week I brought out that um, the Apostle Paul was writing this as an encouragement letter and he was actually in prison when he is writing uh, a letter of encouragement. Um, we are studying uh, a journey into stress-free living. If you look at the news, if you listen to the things that are going on in, in life, in our world, it, it will stress you out. It will cause you to have sleepless nights and fear during the day. The Apostle Paul was addressing this issue many, many years ago, but it's still applicable today. So Philippians chapter 3, primarily verses 7 through 14 is what we're going to be looking at. The title of this lesson is Making the Most of Your Life. Making the Most of Your Life. <clears throat> One thing that causes a tremendous amount of stress is not knowing how to make the most out of our lives. Jesus didn't come just so we could have all of our sins forgiven and a home in heaven. Now, he came for that, but that's not the only reason. He also came that we could have uh, life and that more abundantly, that we could make the most of our lives here and now and to have life eternally in heaven. So he doesn't want you to wait until you die to enjoy the abundant life. So what are some of the ways that we could make the most of our lives. <clears throat> Number one, we just, well, let me just stop there and say, recently we had uh, graduations here in Sumter and all across America, and there'll be young people who are trying to figure out what to do with their life. Some of them will go to college and hopefully find their path there. Others will uh, start into the workforce, but uh, it is important that we find the will of God for our lives and that we are operating in the path that God has ordained for us. In so doing, it causes us to be fulfilled and happy. Now, uh, the first point I want to make is make an exchange. Paul writes, but what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Paul once highly valued his religious pedigree. His religious pedigree. But now consider it loss, is what Paul was saying. Paul considered everything that kept him from trusting in Christ as Savior and finding real joy in his life, he considered all of that as loss. Before he received Christ, what Paul thought were assets were really liabilities as far as his salvation and joy were concerned. Paul really was trying to work his salvation, work for, and I brought that out last week, uh, he was trying to work for his salvation instead of working out his salvation. When you find out what God wants you to do, you are working out his plan. Uh, you're not working for salvation. You're working out the plan that God has ordained for you. When Paul came to understand the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, all his accomplishments became nothing more, as he put it, dung by comparison. And that's in chapter 3, verse 8. The word translated dung um, is what we would today call manure. So when Paul was writing to them, he said, Everything that I held so dear, all my religious accomplishments were manure. Now, that's taken a pretty hard stance uh, on, on your past. I would have to say, though, if people would look at their past a little bit more as being manure, they might would flee from some of the things that they once did. 
Some people are so proud of their sins. They're so proud of their cheating and lying and conniving. They're running around their, their addictions, and they seem to brag on it and want, to, want people to applaud them. Paul was saying, I, uh, everything that I work so hard for in religion, I count that as manure. Paul used the strongest possible word to describe his disdain for all the religious elements that had kept him from knowing Christ. He was an avid enemy of Christ and those who represented Christ. Apart from Christ, how does Paul describe all humanity? In Romans chapter 3, in verse 10, he wrote, there is none righteous, no, not one. When you become a Christian, you exchange your sin for Christ's righteousness. You exchange your guilt for a clear conscience. Hallelujah. And, and meaningless life for a life with purpose and significance. I've, I've got to take time to read that again. When... When you become a Christian, you exchange your sin for Christ's righteousness. You exchange your guilt for a clear conscience. Hallelujah. A meaningless life for a life with purpose and significance. And last but not least, you exchange an eternity in hell for an eternity in heaven. Now, I tell you what, if that doesn't relieve stress, if that doesn't help you make the most of your life, you, you really, uh, you, you're pretty far gone. I just want to tell you, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to understand the exchange. Uh, it doesn't take rocket science to understand that Christ is offering better than what the devil is offering you. Christ is offering better than what the world can offer you. Christ is offering better than what you can concoct in your own life. When you become a Christian, uh, you have access to the riches of glory. Paul was overjoyed to exchange the tremendous of bur burdens of futile, self-righteous efforts. Listen to how he put it. For that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of which is of God by faith, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. And Paul describes uh, the righteousness in 2 Chronicle, pardon me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Listen to how he put it. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So God allowed his son to bear the sins so that we could be righteous. What an exchange. What an exchange. This righteousness is unattainable by obedience to the law or by any human efforts. You cannot work your way to heaven and you, you cannot concoct the plan good enough that God will wink and say, okay, you're, you're good. It only comes through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. When we place our faith in Christ, we exchange our sins for righteousness. Wow. We, we exchange our sins for righteousness. This means in Christ, we are all God requires us to be and all we could ever uh, be, it will be through Christ. It's never of ourselves. It's not of our own works, lest any man should boast. Because of Christ's death on the cross, we can exchange our sins for righteousness, which is of God by faith. In Galatians chapter 2, in verse 16, it expresses this truth knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith in Christ 
and not by the works of the law. There are a lot of people who are telling you, well, if you go to church, and, and, and they, they hang their head on that. Well, praise God for people who go to church. But I just want to remind you, the devil goes to church. The devil will go to church to try to disrupt church, but he goes to church. Uh, and, and well, yeah, yeah, but I, I pray. There's a lot of people who pray, but they, they are not committed to the move of Christ. We are changed and justified not by works, not by the works of the law, not by the laws of man, but by faith in Jesus Christ. The second point tonight is develop a growing relationship with Christ. Um, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. Now listen to this very carefully. Christianity is not a religion. It is classified by many as a religion, but I want to make sure that you understand Christianity is a relationship. Um, religion will not get you to heaven. Relationship with Jesus Christ will get you to heaven. Paul writes that I may know him in chapter 3, verse 10. The word know um, is a Greek word. It refers to knowing someone and establishing a relationship. Paul uh, did not just want to know the facts about Christ, but he wanted to know him personally. Do you know who the president of the United States is? Do you know where he lives? Do you know his wife's name? Do you know him personally? There is a big difference of knowing his name, where he lives, what his wife's name is, than knowing someone personally. Everyone under the sound of my voice would probably say at some point that they said, once I got to know that person, I really like them, or once I got to know them, they are very different when you really get to know them. Well, I must declare to you, getting to know Jesus Christ is a relationship. Oh, you can say, well, I know that he is the son of God. Well, the devils know he's the son of God. People can declare he is the son of God, but having a relationship with him is what changes. Being a Christian is much more than knowing the facts of Jesus' life. It is knowing him personally. You may say, how do I know if I know him personally? I go to church, I read my Bible, and I pray. However, you can do all these things and still not know Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, it tells us we can know if our... our tells us we can know if we know Jesus personally. Listen to what it says. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, if you're still doing the same things that you did before you repented, uh, you don't know him. If you're still doing the same old things habitually, I'm not talking about slipping up, making a mistake. I'm talking about you haven't changed. You're still in the same path. You're still in the same uh, uh, circles, doing the same sins, same actions that you did. Uh, you just went through the motions of religion. But when the Bible says when we have a relationship with Christ, all things pass away, and behold, all things become new. This doesn't mean that we must follow a list of rules without messing up before we can really know the Lord. That's what keeps a lot of people from ever giving Christ a chance. They feel like, well, the, the list of things are so big that I can't ever live up to that. It, it's so much that I would have to change, so much I'd have to get right. Listen, that's 
what you're trying to do, what you have to change, what you have to get right, when it's time for you to say, Lord, would you come into my life and help me to get it right? Help me. He gives us strength. He gives us encouragement. He gives us anointing to be able to change our, our, our sinful ways. It means obedience is the natural result of getting to know Jesus personally. Jesus came to the earth and died on the cross so we could have eternal life. In his prayer the night before he was crucified, uh, he says this in John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent that they may know you and they may know Christ. That's what he was trying to say. Father, I want them to know you and I want them to know me. Now see, you can know the pastor and you can know granny. You can go know grandpa. You can know great preachers. And all of that is good and it'll help you. But until you know Jesus Christ and know him as a friend, know him as one that sticks closer than a brother, know him as a savior, know him as a healer, know him as your best friend, then w without him in your life, you're not going to be stress-free. Paul knew getting to know Jesus personally meant he would experience the power of the resurrection. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and gives new life in Christ Jesus enables us to know Jesus and become more like him. So Paul was a proponent of the resurrection. And Paul tells us getting to know Christ includes, uh-oh, this part you might not want to hear, includes the fellowship of his sufferings. As we get to know Jesus personally, our lives are transformed. And then we sometimes must deal with rejection and ridicule by those who don't know Christ. Thus, we are sharing in his sufferings. Jesus made it very plain not everyone is going to uh, love you. Not everyone is going to accept your message. And he was saying not everyone loved him and not everyone accepted him. And he made it very plain not everyone is going to accept you. Some people don't want you to change because it makes them look bad. If you change, it makes them look bad because they are still doing the things that they know are wrong. Paul wants to know Christ even more. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead gives us the power to live for him, which means we are being made conformable unto his death. That's in verse 10. In other words, we die to our old nature and our old desires. Have you ever felt, uh, I really want to do better but I have this temptation, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. Well, Paul had those types of feelings too, but his old nature was crucified, and he was resurrected in new life with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave him power to die to his old self, his old nature, and his old desires. Paul was saying this so that by any means... I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul is confident of his salvation and resurrection. Um, I think Paul is referring to something he wants to attain that is more than just resurrection. It is something Paul wants to attain at the resurrection. And it is the same thing we should want to attain. In 1 John chapter 2, verse uh, 28, it says, and now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have 
confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I believe Paul was saying, I want to attain a life so, so pleasing that when I stand before him, uh, I'm not going to be ashamed. Paul had a lot to be ashamed of, but you and I have a lot to be ashamed of. Paul called himself the chief among sinners. Paul was adamantly out trying to uh, disrupt uh, Christian worship. He was trying to have them imprisoned, thrown in jails. He was even having them killed. He held the coats of those who, as they stoned uh, uh, Stephen. And Paul is now saying, I want to attain where I don't have to be ashamed when I stand before the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, all the bad things that I've done, all the wickedness that I've done in the past, uh, how could I ever get to a place where I won't be ashamed when I stand before God? Listen, what God will remember against you is sins that are not covered by the blood of his son. But if you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins, he covers that, and the Bible says it's never to be remembered against you again. God is not going to bring up your past if you, get, if you get it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul knows that the Christian life is a process, and I want to encourage you. Uh, when, when I got saved, um, I, I didn't have that explained to me real well. It wasn't that people were trying to hold it from me, keep it from me. It just wasn't explained to me very well. That Christian life is a process. Just because you repent doesn't mean all of a sudden you are in an, in an euphoric state and everything is perfect. You, you no longer have fleshly desires. You no longer want to sin. You no longer want to do the things that are wrong. Uh, that is not what that means. Uh, it is a process, a lifetime of learning and growing. See, why I encourage people to get into the Word of God is the Bible says we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm still growing. One songwriter put it this way. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and uh, patient he must be. He's still working on me. Aren't you glad that he's working on us? And so when you make a mistake, when you fail, when you come short, just say, Lord, I'm sorry, and I don't want to make that mistake again. I don't want to fail you. I don't want to come short and I'm asking for your grace and your mercy so that I can attain the resurrection and not be ashamed when I stand before you. Paul doesn't want to be misunderstood. He is not claiming his conversion made him perfect. This would lead to haughtiness and pride, which are very dangerous because in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, it says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. To become a better Christian, we must be like Paul. Be dissatisfied with our present spiritual condition. I highlighted that in my notes, and I want to say that one more time. To be a better Christian, we must be like Paul, dissatisfied with our present spiritual condition. How an athlete gets better, how an athlete improves his skills is by not being satisfied at the level he's at. Now listen, we've got some great athletes here in Sumter, but just imagine that there's a, a person that they have skills at the high school level and they have potential to move up, but yet still all they hear is you possibly could become a college athlete. You possibly could become a pro athlete. And so instead of working to improve their skills, they just keep their skill level where it's at. More than likely, they never will attain to the next level or to the pro level. You and I, 
We should not ever be satisfied with where we're at. We should constantly be seeking more of Christ, constantly seeking to understand his word more fully, constantly improving our prayer life, constantly uh, doing the things that he has called us to do, loving our neighbor, doing it better. As I said last week, not being a grumbler, uh, not, not stirring up dissension, but to be that person that is positive and trying to do what is right. Uh, Paul uh, understands to become a better Christian, you must be dissatisfied with your present spiritual condition. Paul continues, but I follow after if that I may apprehend for which I also, also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended we will never grow in our relationship with Christ until we realize growth is necessary. Paul was saying, I haven't attained. I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to get better. I'm still trying to get to that next level. And the last point tonight is let go of the past. If you are going to be stress-free, you must let go of the past. Paul writes this. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and that's in chapter 3, verse 13, to make your life the most of your life, to make, your, to make the most of your life, stop wasting time regretting the past. It's past. It's gone. Let it go. Let go of your guilt. Let go of your grudges. Uh, you can't change the past, but with God's help, you can change your future. Holding on to your past can prevent you from being what God wants you to be in the present. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're constantly looking back, look at my failures, look at my shortcomings, um, just keep pressing forward. We can't drive our cars looking in the rearview mirror. Uh, we can't run a race constantly looking behind us. To make the most of your life, stop concentrating on what uh, you have been and start concentrating on what you can be in Christ. Paul continues, I press toward the mark. Now, I, I need to go back just a moment. Because when Paul said forgetting those things which are behind, Paul was a human being like you and I. We don't have the ability to forget some of the hurts, some of the bad things that have happened in our life. Uh, we don't have those abilities. That, that We have a memory. God gave us memory. But Paul was saying, I choose not to dwell on it. I choose not to think on it. I choose to let it be in my past. And then here he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now please listen to what I'm getting ready to read. The mark and the prize are the same. At the Greek games, the winner of a race was taken to the seat of the judge and a wreath was placed on his head. This is the prize Paul is reaching and pressing toward. Paul describes his goal in his uh, last letter in 2 Timothy, uh, and, and it, he writes this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. So here's what I'm trying to tell you tonight. If you're going to live stress-free, you have to put the past in the past, but you need to know what is God's plan for your future and then press toward it. Find out. 
if I could use one more example right here. If I was to right now tell everyone, get in your car and go to um, uh, Kalamazoo. And you might say, well, I don't know where Kalamazoo. And I said, well, just start driving. Uh, you would say, that, that's ridiculous. I need to plug it into my GPS or I need to get a map and try to find where Kalamazoo is. Um, and, and that is absolutely the truth. If you're going to start a journey, you need to know where you're headed. If you're starting a journey for Christ, you need to know where you're headed. Find out from God what his plan is for you and do that to God be the glory because he will give you a plan and if you'll press toward it, you're going to have a stress-free life. Right now, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you ought to be stressed out because you're trying to do things on your own. But right now, you can change. Heavenly Father, I pray that if there's anyone who doesn't know you as their personal Savior, I pray that they would say, I'm sorry of my sins, dear Lord. I want you to forgive me. I want you to come into my heart. I want you to change my life. I want you to take my past and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against me again. And then, dear God, as you do that, I pray that you'd give me direction for my future and help me to accomplish what you have set out, what you have set for me to, to accomplish. Now, dear Heavenly Father, I give you my life and I ask you to forgive me of all my past and all my wrong all my sins in Jesus' name. Lord, for every person who is experiencing stress, help them to put their past behind them and press toward the mark, the prize of the high calling of God. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's be dismissed with our scripture that says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Thank you for tuning in. Hope to see you Sunday morning at 9 or 11 or both. God bless you. I hope that you'll get up and be in the house of God. We love you. God bless you.